pregnant, stab each other. And some of that apple, your body realizes is not useful, and that becomes caca. The funny thing is, you don't become a hundred apples when you eat a hundred apples, because your body knows to either keep what it needs and use it, or get rid of what it doesn't need as caca. There is one exception, like you see in the animation. There are these little things that look useful, turn out to be useless, and because they look useful they are kept, but because they are useless they're never used. They accumulate, they build up. Remember yesterday, my demo, where I steal from your wallets, and some of the stuff I can use, but some I cannot? Can we do that? Yeah. If I'm picking pockets for 10 straight days, how much plastic am I going to have? Oh. Let's say 10 cards. This is exactly the point that I need to make today. So now, let's figure out what magnification is. You all realize I made a very tasteless joke about being a poor alcoholic teacher, right? And do you realize that that was an especially tasteless joke, given that our job has the highest rate of alcoholism among all jobs that require certification? Yes. What about professional alcohol drinks? <laughs> Apparently they don't require certification. Um, <coughs> so, I'd like to lively up the conversation from yesterday by adding other concepts. First of all, um, you may not know that I am not the only teacher who needs to pick pockets to buy whiskey. As a matter of fact, all your teachers pick pockets to buy whiskey. Mr. Carmine, a good friend of mine, we exchange picking pocket techniques. Name some other teachers. Who do you have? Forrester. Forrester, also a total loser, needs to pick pockets to buy his alcohol. Funny joke, he's actually the cleanest living man I know. Um, Wagner, you know, he's got to slow down that crazy brain of his somehow. So he picks pockets and he buys buckets and buckets of booze. Jackson, to temper all of that um, social analysis. Dan. Dan actually does pick pockets. And <laughs> Dan actually does pick pockets and buy booze. It's not a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. Evan's never had a drum <laughs> Let's get back to me now, please. Let's get back to me now. If each of us teachers picks one wallet a day and takes one credit card a day, because high school kids don't have a lot of classes, so each of us, on average, will have seven credit cards stolen per week. Right? Each teacher. Now, something else you may not know is that our principal has a ridiculous gambling habit. Our principal, man, that guy loves to gamble. So he calls these bogus meetings all the time, gets the teachers in the room, and says, oh, Mr. Carmian, look, Brad Pitt. And Carmian goes, really? And then he gets pickpocketed. <laughs> so then he goes, look, a knee board. <laughs> so <laughs> Carmian goes, Roof! and then he gets pickpocketed. And you can imagine that when you pickpocket a pickpocket, you're going to get a whole bunch of credit cards and a whole bunch of cash, right? So the, the principal can go out that night, play the ponies, and he's got seven credit cards in his pocket. Then the next day, he calls another bogus meeting, and he goes, look, Mr. Jackson, social injustice. And Mr. Jackson goes, what? And then, whoop, he gets pickpocketed. Look, it's Robert Zinn. Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn. 
something. Is it Howard's? Yeah, Howard's. Howard. Yeah. Howard. The next day, the principal has picked up seven more credit cards by having picked the pocket of a pickpocket. Does this make everybody? By the end of the week, after he goes, look, Jose, it's a pile of granola. And he says, look, um, Dan Williams, it's a bunch of Holcomb clothing. Like, he will pickpocket of all the different teachers. Every day he takes seven credit cards. And so within seven days, do you guys realize that each of his teachers will accumulate seven credit cards, but the principal will accumulate 49? Then the cowboy boots. <laughs> then, you also probably don't know that our superintendent oh, no. got a little nose candy habit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really expensive. Cash. Nurse? Yes. <laughs> that's what they call him, the doctor of cash. <laughs> And so Dr. Cash, he calls meetings at the district, and he meets with all the principals. <laughs> and he goes, hey, Mr. Pecchio, look, it's actually a small golf cart. That's a really good cool. golf cart. <laughs> and he distracts Mr. Pecchio and scoop every day. The superintendent picks the pocket of another principal. The superintendent gets 49 from Pecchio and... 49 from the guy at San Marcos, and 49 from the lady guy at Peter High. That's a lady guy. 49 from the lady guy at Los Pueblos, and every day that the superintendent's picking pockets, he's picking up a bigger and bigger number. And I need you to notice something. After a week, each of the teachers has seven. After a week, each of the principals has 49. After a week, the superintendent has packed on what? 49 times seven? 350? <laughs> okay, 343. Yeah. <laughs> so if it all counts up like that, wouldn't at the end of the week the teachers have zero? Yeah, if you assume that they're not doing anymore, that's true. Yeah. So I just want you guys to notice the principle of biomagnification. Accumulation happens inside of an organism. You keep stuff that's useless even though you thought it was useful. But magnification, and this is an important distinction for you to make, <coughs> noteworthy, magnification is a trophic phenomenon. Magnification happens within a food web where the concentration increases as you travel up the food chain. Yeah? Is that like the bald eagles in PDT? And I even have a picture of that coming up. Watch this one. You see the big fish that eats the little fish. They've got even bigger problems. Uh, okay. That, that's my own. I want you all to notice something, like the principal who has a higher burden of credit cards because he picks higher up on the food chain. That fish, because he's little fish, he knows that he's not becoming a big stack of little fish, right? The big fish is not a collection of little fish. Well, it's both at this level. Because, first of all, the big fish is accumulating pennies also. But second of all, it is magnifying the concentration. It's gathering. <laughs> and then, of course, what happens when humans eat higher on the food chain? You can imagine, a human will take all those pennies today and then we get back to work tomorrow big fish keeps doing the big fish thing 
big fish keeps building the concentration of pennies. Fisherman baits his hooks. Takes the boat out to the ocean. Takes another big fish. And inside the human, you're starting to accumulate again. says what's the bad content it's some useless thing remember if it's useless it's not bad but if it's something which can become toxic at high concentrations it might be a problem a good example for example is methyl mercury little methyl mercury is no big deal but the higher you go on the food chain the more you concentrate it it starts to be a problem <laughs> right. Right. You see, look, I even made you a little demo right up here to explain this. Let's talk about mercury. Humans have increased the amount of mercury in the atmosphere because we keep burning fossils. You guys know that? You can take a million dinosaurs, you pack them into a couple gallons of gasoline, that's a lot of mercury a million dinosaurs worth of mercury, and then we light that on fire and it becomes mercury gas and it goes into the atmosphere. And then tomorrow we'll burn more gasoline and make more mercury in the atmosphere. Every day we make more and more mercury in the atmosphere. That stuff drizzles onto the ocean. Like, imagine that this is the ocean. You're all sitting on top of the ocean, okay? Now, the phytoplankton in one tile worth of ocean has received one tile worth of mercury. Does that make sense? Zooplankton eats one tile worth of phytoplankton. Now, sorry, ten tiles worth of phytoplankton. Now you've got ten tiles worth of mercury in the zooplankton. Baby fish eat ten of those, which is a hundred tiles of mercury. That's a lot more mercury in the baby fish. The sardine eats ten of those. So we're talking a hundred tiles worth of mercury in a sardine. And the tuna might eat ten of those, so now we're talking a thousand tiles of mercury in the tuna. That's why pregnant women aren't supposed to eat predators out of the ocean. Have you guys heard this? That pregnant women should limit their intake of tuna, salmon, and shark? That's only because of where they eat. It's not all seafood. Pregnant women can eat as many sardines as she wants. No problem. Knock yourself out. They don't want to explain the whole thing, so they make it really simple. They just tell you the list. Limit your intake of these fish. Because, of course, a pregnant woman will be putting all of that mercury into her fetus because she takes all of the really valuable, fat-soluble stuff, and instead of storing it in her own fat, she goes, no, 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 this is for my baby who really needs it. So you get babies with birth deformities because you're packing all the mercury in the baby. Does that make sense to everybody? So now I tell you a story. There were these two doctors called Lydico and Bodig. <coughs> they were working on an island called Guam. Some of you might know that Guam is a United States protectorate. We have military bases there. These are extremely important because of their strategic proximity to Japan. That's Guam right there. That's Hawaii. That's Japan. That's the US. And during World War II, we wanted to keep some military people stationed here in case something was going on here. So Guam was strategically important to the United States, and that's how most of us know about it. Guam is a beautiful tropical island, like you would probably imagine from the map. Uh, like Easter Island, it's pretty dry, it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's sunny. But unlike Easter Island, it does have these giant reservoirs of fresh water. So it's a really, really nice island to live on. Polynesians have been there for a very long time way before the Easter Islanders. 
these Polynesians are called the Chamorro. And I don't really know anything about them. I know that they were a traditional Polynesian people. I know that they have the traditional Polynesian uh, warfare culture. Uh, like many Polynesian uh, people, the Chamorro have a calendar that's based on natural events. I think this is really beautiful. So their months are not like based on um, uh, historical stuff like hours, and they're not really specific, like 31 days. Their months are a natural cycle. So it's like the period when the white flowers open, followed by the period when the dolphins make their babies followed by the period when the whales come closest to shore, by the period when the flying fish jump the most. They're all like natural events. They're sculptors, like most Polynesians. I told you about this. So instead of building giant phallic head sculptures, they built these giant phallic um, columns with a weird flower pot looking thing on top. And like many um, remote, are you copying my question? Mm -hmm. Like many remote Polynesian islands, Guam was a major missionary target early in the missionary period. Uh, what would that be? The 1600s or something? The missionaries made some big changes to the diet of the Chamorro. They recommended the Chamorro start wearing Western clothing, that they cover their genitals and boobies, that they um, uh, speak different languages, that they farm, that they raise pigs. And the diet culture of the Chamorro changed a whole lot except for one delicacy. The Chamorro picked up a very Western diet, except when they have big parties, they still eat traditional food, especially this one delicacy I'll tell you about later. And some of the Westerners living on the island at the beginning of the 1900s noticed the rise of a new disease. The first time anybody ever saw this disease was probably 1904. It was a, uh, a neural degenerative disease like Lou Gehrig slash Parkinson's. Uh, you lose control of your muscles and that gets worse over time. So first you get uh, clumsy, then you become paralyzed, then your heart, your lungs, and your stomach stop working. And it's slow, so it's a horrible way to die. At about the time that American military were becoming most common on Guam, the incidence of the disease spiked. It made some interesting politics because right when the military action was like going crazy and everybody was like being all strategic and like we gotta figure stuff out, we gotta fight the Japanese or whatever. The disease had escalated to a point where it was the leading cause of mortality of the Chamorro. You would go into a village and half the people would be dying of this. And um, it was especially common for men who would otherwise be very healthy, uh, healthy appetites, hard working, most productive age, 25 to 40. And so you can imagine a lot of the natives thought, well, we're being poisoned by whitey. And so there was like little scuffles and like soldiers would get jumped if they were out at night. Soldiers would like have retribution and beat up Chamorro Indians. And tensions were very high. So both the missionaries and the military said, look, we've got to figure out what's going on, because this is gnarly. And there were these two doctors that couldn't agree what the problem was. One was called Lydigo, the other one was called Bodic. That's the name of the disease, Lydigo Bodic.
the doctors kept writing all these papers, and they were like, oh, it's got to be this, no, it's got to be that, no, it's got to be this, no, it's got to be that. And then somebody figured it out. So here it comes. When the military occupation of the island <coughs> increased, the United States government bought up all the pigs. You know, because they wanted to feed the Americans, and Americans eat a lot of pork, and the Chamorro were like, wait, you'll pay me a ton of money for one stupid pig? That's great. And so they, Chamorro happily sold off all the pigs. And of course, now, when you have a big old party, you don't have any more pig to cook, but you know, you got all this money, so you can buy this one Chamorro delicacy. And the Chamorro were like, stoked. They're like, hey, instead of cooking one of these stupid pigs, we get to eat like hundreds of this one delicacy? A flying fox. It's a giant fruit bat. Their bodies are like this. They have wingspan like that. Apparently they're really dumb. They love to snuggle. My, uh, ate fruit. Uh, well, a person I know that teaches at the University of California, Santa Barbara, did research in Queensland, Australia, which is a very common, and he found one struck by a truck on the side of the road one day, he took it home, he fixed its wing, and the thing became his buddy, <laughs> and like, it would like climb up on him, and they, they used their claws and their feet to climb, you know, they climb trees, and they just fly into them. Um, and so they, they like, climb up, and then they like, snuggle, like, hug, <laughs> they put their head into your shoulder. Like your cat. Um, they also carry rabies and they're full of mites. It's not like necessarily a good idea. Uh, and they're dumb as hell. My, my buddy could always tell when these things flew into his room because he'd leave his window open so the bat so the bat could fly in and out. And on the way into the apartment it would always run into the ceiling fan. And it <laughs> slammed into one of the walls or slammed into the floor or slammed into his bed. And so he'd be sleeping, and he'd hear, whoosh, whoosh, thump, 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 slam. And they would like break lamps, and like it happened every night for like two years. And he'd get his off there. <laughs> turn off your sound It's Queensland. It's like 100 degrees. Is that a real picture? Yeah. Now they sleep like this with their eyes covered, so you can imagine they're pretty easy food for the Chamorro. And so I was like, hey, we can't eat any more pigs, but we could pay Jack to go kill a whole bunch of bats. And the bats are like, this is great. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they make easy food. You just slingshot them out of the trees, or you hit them with a stick if they're low enough, and then step on them, you eat them. You know about the size of a rabbit? I can't imagine that there are a whole lot of meat. You probably have to eat a whole bunch of them to get full. And one of those doctors was trying to figure out, like, why are all these people dying? And just in interviewing them, you know, which population goes to barbecues the most, you know, like working class dudes. 25 to 40? And it says, so you guys all go to the barbecues a lot, and those are the population that barbecues the most, and then at the barbecue, you used to eat pigs, but now you all eat a bunch of bats, and so the population that's most affected by the disease has had a recent change in their diet. Hmm. So I started looking into the bat thing. And these bats, their entire diet is the fruit of a cycad. You know what cycads are? It's like a really, really primitive old tree. It's not really a tree. You see them, and like some people have them in their front yards. They're like really common in landscaping. They have like they're like palm tree sort of, but they're low to the ground, and they're more like bushy palm tree sort of thing. Cycads, and they make these little fruit. And the fruit are like a big old seed with a little bit of oily meat on them, and that's what the bats eat. That's all that they eat. That's their entire life is just eating these fruit from these one species of cycad. Tree looks like this. Oh, that, that's an ancient one. They, they take like a billion years to get that tall. But yeah, it's, it's a big-ass tree. That's a good idea. Um, 
And as it happens, you guys know that plants and bacteria are often symbiotic. We talk about that, right? The nitrogen fixing bacteria, for example. And you also remember that the soil is a complex food web where everything's trying to eat everything, right? So like rattlesnakes are poisonous so that the rabbit won't eat, so that uh, the fox won't eat rattlesnakes. Well, bacteria are poisonous so that amoebas won't eat bacteria. Does it make sense, everybody? At the base of these trees is a type of bacteria that produces this toxin. And you don't have to be a chemist to tell me what the problem is here. CH3. Not alone. The, the CH3 at the bottom is creates a methyl group, so it looks like it's good for humans for animals. This compound is called uh, whatever. And all of this stuff means like whatever. But look at that. Methyl group. Bacteria makes a little toxin, so it won't be eaten by amoebas. The tree soaks up the toxin, because it's in the ground. The toxin, when it's absorbed into the tree, is mistaken for something useful because of the methyl group. And the same way that a pregnant woman puts all the best nutrients into her embryo, a tree will put all of its best supplies into the seeds which are then eaten by the bats, which are increasingly eaten by the Chamorro Indians. You could probably eat one bat and be fine, you could eat two bats and be fine, you could eat three bats and be fine, but at some point, you reach what's called the threshold of toxicity. So by eating more and more and more bats, all of a sudden you get to that point where they start to affect your body. And because a lot of these dudes were eating way over the threshold, they were having this gnarly, crippling neurogenetic, uh, neurological um, deterioration. Doctors figured this out. They said, uh, hey, natives, uh, if you eat less bat, you'll probably be okay. And that was the end of the disease. Somebody, what? No, probably not. <coughs> you might remember at the, at the beginning of the year, I told you about this woman named Rachel Carson who wrote this book called Silent Spring that was really important. And I said it was about how DDT gets into the water, then it gets into the algae, then it gets into the fish, then it gets into the big fish, and then it gets into the birds, and the birds, they lay soft eggs, they sit on them, and they get smushed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, six units later, there's the science. This is exactly what she wrote her book on. You see, a lot of our toxins are okay when we spray them. But there are pathways in nature which magnify the concentration of these poisons. That was the big deal in her book. She says, look, you're just trying to get rid of like aphids on the broccoli. A billion miles over there, birds are all dying because they're drinking all your poison. So I use a little bit of uh, ant poison to get rid of the ants. And then the, the cricket that has to live in the grass is eating all the grass, digesting the grass, crapping out the grass, but it's soaking up all that poison. So the cricket has like that much poison in it. Then each of those crickets is eaten by a rodent, and the mouse digests the rodent and craps out the shell and makes energy out of it, but it's stashing like that much ant poison. And then the snake that eats all those mice is going to crap out the hair and crap out the bones, digest all the good stuff, make energy out of the mouse, and it keeps, by mistake, like a lot of poison. And then the bear that eats all those snakes, well, he's going to digest all the scales and crap out all the bones and 
make energy out of the snakes, but now that bear has had like buckets of ant poison poured into him. Because that trophic mistake magnifies the impact. The life is like a filter for all that poison to put it all in one place into the bear. Then if you happen to eat a whole bunch of bears, it's like you just went out into the garden and licked up all the ant poison for square miles of grass. And this is why it's dangerous to eat at the top of the food web because of biomagnification. Did I fumble this explanation or is it working? Sometimes I really feel like I'm nailing it, and sometimes I'm really not sure, and sometimes I'm kind of confused, and then sometimes the kids ask a lot of questions, and sometimes they don't, and I can't tell if you really get it, if you want me to move on, or if you're like shell shock, and I just too many good words. Yeah. Would it still be magnified if the very one snake, which had had one rabbit, which had had one cricket? No, the other way around. Because the cricket's this big, and the bear's giant. So, get smaller. So concentration gets watered down by the mass of the animal. So the reason they get bigger is because they have to eat more of the little animals. And because they usually live longer. Wait, live longer? You mean that it would over... Oh, the got it. Yeah. longer than a snake, lives longer than a mouse, lives longer than a cricket. Moving on! You see, this is why I get pissed when people ask me about toxins. Everybody's like, hey, it's okay to use this pesticide, it's non-toxic. It's like, well, the question is how much you're getting. We found this in all sorts of toxins. We've seen this in tons of different toxins. So, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but there's this, like, scam where people sell non-toxic dish soap and non-toxic deodorant and non-toxic water bottles, and I hate that crap. People say, oh, you shouldn't use that kind of lipstick because it's got so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so is toxic. Or, oh, you know, you shouldn't use these types of water bottles because that's made with blah, 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 and that's toxic. People say, don't use that soap, it's toxic. Don't use that sugar type, or that sugar substitute, it's toxic. Students, someone told me I shouldn't drink water out of plastic because plastic leaches chemicals that are toxic. Was that person right, or was that person wrong? Oh. Yeah, what? They were wrong in the sense that it doesn't really matter if you have like a bottle of water. It's not like you're drinking a bunch of pure plastic, but they're also, um, like, I don't know, they're right because it's probably less healthy to drink that plastic than that glass or something. Like yeah, I mean, they're just unfortunately mixing their apples and their oranges because no substance is toxic. Toxic does not describe a noun. Toxic describes an amount of a noun. It's not that they're right and it's not that they're wrong. They just haven't finished the sentence. This is why I think it's really stupid when people say, oh, use this dish soap. It's non-toxic. Like, really? Like, I could cook that down, put it in a syringe, shoot it in my veins, and I'm cool? Like, I could freebase a whole bunch of that dish soap, and I'm going to be all right? Remember, students, nothing is toxic if you have a little bit, and everything is toxic if you have enough. I don't know if you heard about that poor lady that tried to win her kid a Wii on the radio. So they said, like, hey, do a contest, and whoever drinks the most water, they, they win a wee. For, and so some lady's like a, she was like a school nurse or something, and she's like, you yeah, know, I love my kid, I can't afford a wee, I'll do this. And it was called, it's called, like, hold your wee for a wee, or something like that. 
And it was like, how many gallons of water you could drink? You drink like 22 gallons in an hour or something. I mean, whatever. Yeah. Don't quote me on the number, but it's enough that it messes up the way that your nerves communicate. Her heart stopped working. Yeah, she, she died at the radio or in the ambulance. She can't put it in a will. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that one guy who got second place fell. <laughs> he felt really bad. Yeah. Um, look, is water toxic? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's like, well, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't mean you shouldn't drink water. That just means the quantity also makes a difference. The substance is just half of that. The other half is the dosage. You know, like, I'm a doctor. I can make you a clinical promise. One cigarette does not cause cancer. Cigarettes cause cancer, especially lots of cigarettes cause cancer. One cigarette does not cause cancer. It's not like cigarette, in essence, is toxic. It's how many. Like you can all go home and have like one microscopic little grain of crystal methamphetamine and you'll be fine and you won't be addicted and you won't feel it. Yes. That doesn't mean it's good for you. That doesn't mean it's not addictive. It just means like, hey, the dosage is just as much a part of this conversation as the substance. <laughs> Are we all good with that? Look out for this toxic, non-toxic thing. It's a hoax. People sell you crap. Okay, the book up on 6.4. <clears throat> Quickly, please. <laughs> you like the movie? Can you? Pretty scary. <laughs> what I thought you were leading to at the end. Uh, Guam food thing is that the bats get the pigs and then cause the food. No vocab? What is subsidence? Yeah. Subsidence is when the surface sinks in because water's moving through the soil and taking away tiny amounts of tiny particulates. That's why cities that are built at the mouth of a river are all sinking into the ocean. Because being at the mouth of a river, the soil is sediment. And so because the soil is sediment, as the water flows through, stuff sinks. Santa Barbara is not built at the mouth of a river, so that's not really a problem for us. But Venice Beach, Venice Beach and New Orleans, sorry, Venice, Italy, and New Orleans are both screwed. <laughs> yeah. So who determines acceptable risk? It's a totally subjective and personal thing. Um, I'll, I'll go to a, a party with my wife's family, and I'll see people that smoke like a pack a day, or drink like eight glasses of whiskey a day, tell me. <coughs> that I'm an irresponsible father because I rock climb. It's like, uh, you know I can see that you're dying of heart disease sitting six feet away from me. The number one killer of humans in America. You don't talk to me about rock climbing. I, I bristle at that. I mean, risk is a really personal thing, and of course we can never agree on that, but mathematically there are way bigger fish to fry. You know, you're much more likely to die driving to the airport than you are jumping out of a plane. Yeah. Um, for the sensitivity, how long would it take for it to I don't know what that is, but subsidence is pretty slow. Um, well, two things are possible. 
subsidence is very gradual. But what can also happen is if the rocks are kind of wedged in place, then the stuff underneath will be gone until it's like a vacuum, you know, like an amphitheater. And then again, what's called a sinkhole, <coughs> where all that stuff on top collapses into that space at once, and that can be really sudden. All right. No more vocab? Then um, <coughs> I got to talk about both 59 and 60 today. 59 is about how New Orleans is totally screwed. Uh, I have a list of reasons why New Orleans is really hurting. Sorry, I've been told it's not pronounced New Orleans. Yeah. But it's pronounced New Orleans. Hey, it's New Orleans. There you go. Can I please say that I don't care and I don't believe that there is a single way to pronounce anything? You'll notice I say Jose Caballero, which is not how my mom says, it's just Jose Caballero. There's no single way to pronounce things. I just go with Norland because when I was in Norland, everybody was like, no, 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 it's, you say Norland. I was like, Norland? And they're like, yeah, and they're like, all right, fine, we'll try that. So I'm just going with it. Is this about the pronunciation? No. Okay. Um, well, I don't know. Like everything is going to die, New Orleans is going to sink. Um, here's what I know about New Orleans. Number one, it's built on a river mouth where subsidence is a constant problem. That's guaranteed. <coughs> and it doesn't have the natural renewal of sediment because of the levees. Number two, those levees were built to withstand Category 4 hurricanes, because everybody knows Category 5 hurricanes never happen. Number three, New Orleans is relatively powerless in political terms because it's one of the highest concentrations of poor people in the world. And everybody knows that poor people don't count in politics. I mean, you all realize, right, that if a hurricane hits Beverly Hills, they can find a way to deliver water in less than four days. Other problems with New Orleans are that they had natural protections against storms, protective sandbars, and mangrove swamps that block coastal flooding. But both of those were removed, the sandbars to encourage shipping, and the mangrove swamps to discourage mosquitoes and protect views. So New Orleans unbuckled the belt, <coughs> dropped trowel, and assume the position <laughs> for hurricanes. Now, there's more problems. If you build a map of all the hurricane landfalls in the Gulf of Mexico, the highest concentration is pretty close to one major city Norway. It's pretty darn near the bullseye of Hurricane Alley. And then there's the final whammy. Climate change increases the intensity of hurricanes. Not the number overall. That's a separate natural cycle that does not seem to respond to climate change. But of that number, more and more of them are higher and higher power because of climate change. Remember that the potency of a hurricane is determined by the difference in water and air temperatures. And climate change heats the water much more than the air. So because of climate change, the difference in air and water temperatures increases, which means the intensity of hurricanes increases. This is why I say that more is do. <coughs> it's a damn shame. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. I love Norman. I've been there a couple times. It's like 
truly tragic. Yeah. Could you bring back Negro for us in that part? Sure could. And you're not the only person to think of it. Yeah. Um, how soon do you think the sinking, like, until it gets super serious? Steve, no man's predictions of the future, my friend. Especially dumb idiots that suck at everything. What's your prediction, though? I might not believe you. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the next decade, New Orleans is bound to get slammed by another big ass hurricane. How's that? But don't go to college. And <laughs> I mean, you'll probably survive it if you're a white kid. But I don't, I don't yeah, I think you'll be fine. Like, you're probably not going to live in the low in the lowlands. Uh, your mommy and daddy could probably send a helicopter if they needed it. I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, I have a personal helicopter. Whatever. And so you know what I mean? That like it. I don't know, man. Like, yeah, you're 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 bound to suffer natural disasters anywhere on the planet. You can stay here and get killed by an, uh, an earthquake or a wildfire. So I don't mean to say that like. Right. That's true. You're you're just not necessarily in the most high risk populations of New Orleans. Wherever you go, you'll be pretty safe. <laughs> Yeah. Um, like you showed me that, uh, or uh, you showed all of that map of Guam and all yeah. those tiny little islands. Yeah. Guy, like what, what's stopping them from just being completely submerged? Like They're high above sea level. <laughs> 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 so some of those are not very high above sea level. Mauritius is going to stop being a country in your lifetime. No, I mean they're planning on it. Like they're they're dissolving their currency and they're trying to find a country to adopt them. The president of Mauritius did a stunt where he took his uh, desk and he um, screwed it to cinder blocks and set it up on the bottom of the ocean. And he's a diver because he lives in Mauritius. And so he like dressed up in a business suit and he dived down to his desk and like pulled himself into his chair. I took a photograph of himself sitting in the ocean at his desk, holding his breath, and his suit all wisp and his ties all like wafting. Yeah, he's, I'm sure he, uh, he thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes to like international meetings about climate change, and he's like, "Could somebody please stop doing this to me?" And their point is like, we're not a developed nation. Like, we don't have a lot of cars and coal burning power plants, and we're dead. It's about the injustice of climate change. If the most developed nation that causes the climate change will suffer the least consequences, and those who suffer the most consequences are the least responsible for it. So it's going to go underwater because it's mountainous. Uh, Mauritius? Maybe I'm thinking about the wrong island. Yeah. Mauritania? Oh. Erasmus? In Morocco. Maria de Guadalupe? Hey, look, I, I wish we could start study goal number 60. We're a little bit behind in this period. Instead, I'd like to give you some free hints. Uh, your debate is on Monday. Some of you will go on Tuesday, but you've got to be ready on Monday. Um, <laughs> You, you need to really consider how well you've discussed your research with your team. If you've left it for the last minute, you might be able to do research, but the thing that you need is time to talk about that research. If you haven't discussed it, if you're all up here independently, you're going to lose. Don't write a speech. Don't read while you're presenting. Do everything you can to share your knowledge with each other and try to understand the debate. If you have a chance, try to have a mock debate with each other. Take turns playing the opposite team. Because you need to understand the whole argument, not just whatever topic you use to break up the work. Um, it's kind of a lot of points. Don't forget to bring your research on Monday. Um, Okay, class finishes in like a minute, right? Yeah. <laughs>